Okay, I can't even lift on the knees, but... Hi guys, welcome back to another video. I just hit myself in the face. Uh, hi guys, welcome back to another video or your first video here, I don't know. Welcome if you're new here, welcome either way. This is going to be my autumn going into winter um, book haul. And because I haven't done one for a couple of months, I've got a lot of books to talk to you about, as you can see by the stacks of books. That's my unhaul stack. But I wasn't even able to hold them all up for the thumbnail. So some of these I bought for myself. Some of these I was gifted. Some of these I have hauled since read. And also some that I've hauled read and I will be unhauling. So I won't be going through the synopsis of absolutely everything here, especially if I haven't read it. But let's just start with the books are still on the shelf, so you can't sneak peeks at what's coming up. So first of all, we have Aristotle and Dante. Aristotle and Dante dive into the waters of the world by Benjamin Alire Sands, and this is the sequel to a book I read and really, really loved. Um, Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe and it follows two gay teens who meet and reform a bond over the summer and I thought it just had really really great commentary on being Mex Mexican-American and racism and sexuality also confusing need and desire or saviour's complex. It was a really interesting book. I really, really loved it. So I've been meaning to get to this. So when I saw it in a charity shop for like, I don't know, a pound or something, I decided to pick it up and I will have to find spaces on my shelf for all of these. Also, please ignore my hair. I got really annoyed with it last night and I quite literally just cut it all off because it was annoying me. So I'll be sending this off for a charity that makes wigs for kids with cancer, but uh, I didn't do a good job. <laughs> so please ignore, sorry. Uh, another book that I picked up was Over the Top by Jonathan Van Ness. I love Jonathan. They are one of the I don't know if you call them presenters, but they're one of the people who work on Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, the new version. It's been remade and it's about these five people who do makeovers for people, but not only their looks, but their lifestyle and where they live. And it's such a beautiful, wholesome show. They've really cut out a lot of the cattiness that was in the original series, which I really enjoy. And all of them, I believe, have now started coming out with their own content. Jonathan, I've read their like children's book. It was something about peanuts. I'll put the cover up here, but it was really, really delightful. But I just think that they're, su they're doing such a good job and they're such amazing people. I'm really excited to read more about them. Next, we have a beautiful copy of the Grimm's Fairy Tales, and this is one of the Barnes & Noble leather-bound edition classics I collect, so when I saw this, I just had to pick it up. While I remember, I already shelved this one, but I also got Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, also in this Barnes & Noble leather-bound edition classics. Um, this is one of the ones where, because they're individual books rather than their omnibus editions, they're slightly shorter. So I'll show you two to give an example. So, for example, I have Frankenstein by um, Mary Shelley, and those are the same size, the same width and they don't have like the gold foiling or the silver foiling on the sides because they're an individual book whereas something like this or the Grimm's Fairy Tales because this is an omnibus of two books they put in slightly more effort in terms of the foiling it's got gold foiling satin ribbon and they're just slightly taller and ever so slightly 
um, wider than these. And then the third type of book that Barnes & Noble do are the sort of shortest but then widest books more in a square shape which are versions of children's classics. So the only two that I'm actually collecting are the individual classics and the omnibus classics. That's probably way more <laughs> information than you actually needed but there we go. Next might be a bit of an odd choice, but I will explain it. And that is Mouldy and the Magnificent Sky by uh, Mary Dunn. Now, I know that not a lot of people are going to have heard of this, um, especially given the fact that I was the one who had to add it on to Goodreads. It didn't have a Goodreads um, link associated with it. So when I go out and about in my hometown, I really like to support local Cornish artists and people who release um, books and other bits and pieces just through themselves and so this book is by a local Cornish photographer and they created a children's story and illustrated it with photographs that they took and it's a really, really sweet story. It has a lovely message. It's about Maudie, who is playing on, uh, playing out in the garden and she can't find the sun. And so the clouds take her on a journey to go and find the sun. And it was really, really lovely. I could see this being something that children will really enjoy. And I will definitely be passing it on to either some kids in my family or friends who have children, because I think that they will really enjoy this. While I'm talking about that, I might as well go through the other books that also fit those specifications. So here we have uh, My Daddy is Better Than Your Dad by Claire Poole. So this again is a little comic made by a local Cornish artist. And um, I did read this when I got it, given how short it is. Um, the art is very, very sweet. Story doesn't make the most sense. But then again, I think it's for kids, but I'll be passing this along and I'll talk more about my thoughts on it when I wrap it up. Next, we have Things With Wings by Esther Conan and or Conan, Conan. And this is a really beautiful little book with a bunch of illustrations and scientific descriptions of different animals. But all of them are kind of nature based puns so what one um i can't remember this but like the input for the tiger moth was a cross between a tiger and a moth rather than the actual scientific tiger moth and it's very very sweet the illustrations are gorgeous and i'd really recommend it by the same person i have moon in my room it is a little children's story or kind of poem i think with a little bit of writing and i could definitely see a child really enjoying this it's a very very sweet book next we have two or technically two and a half or three where i was visiting plymouth and they had an alternative fair and a lot of people were marketing books that they had written and released themselves and I like I just like to support local authors so I decided to give some of these a try and I picked up a few where they said that they had um, LGBT main characters. So here we have Underrated by Morwenna Blackwood, Never Us never underestimate a friend and I believe this has to do with uh, drug abuse and uh, toxic friendships friendships I don't exactly know how the LGBT influence comes into this story but I'm willing to give it a go the next one and the reason why I said one and a half is that I also picked up the last girls standing by L.C. Valentine, very sort of 80s, it looks like an old 80s horror uh, VHS, it is a slasher and I also picked up the prequel sort of very short novella 
but I left that at work. So technically I count that as a haul. It has a title very, very similar to The Last Final Girls. I, I can't remember it for now, but if I find the cover of it, I'll put it up here as well. So I am willing to try these out. Slashes aren't normally my thing, but I wanted to support local artists. So I will get to this at some point. The next category of books that I hold are plays where they were all given to me by a friend of mine who was getting rid of a bunch of plays. So these will have been things that he'd been studying at drama school. And so I didn't know much of, like, I didn't recognise any of these before I picked any of them up. So I can't really tell you much. The only one that I have read since is The Cage Bird by David Captain, which was a really interesting um, play about Stockholm Syndrome and wanting to continue to be enslaved or trapped because that is what you've grown used to. It's a very, very tiny, tiny little play, although the writing in here is minuscule. I think that uh, with proper versions of the script, you can get a bigger version because they've increased the typeface. But I'd be really interested to see this. These reviews are going to be slightly less interesting because I really have no idea. So we've got Scott Free New Scottish Plays. So this is a collection of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven plays that I've never heard of. Another collection of Scottish plays. So more Scottish plays I haven't heard of. We have The Ash Girl by Timberlake Wurtenbaker. This Wide Night by Chloe Moss. The Boyfriend, a musical play. A Boy's Life and Search and Destroy by Howard Corder. And Making History by Brian Friel. Actually, looking at it from a distance, that looks a little bit like it's supposed to be a face. I think just from up close, it never really looked like that to me. Hmm. But yeah, I will tell you more about these once I actually read them. I'll continue on with plays for now, just to um, separate out the rest of my haul. So these are all plays that I bought just for myself. Some of them are because I went to see that play, some of them because I just liked the sound of it or had heard of it. So... The ones that I went to see, let's go through those first. Something I really love about theatre nowadays, oh my god my hair. Something I really love about theatre nowadays is that often in the merchandise area in the stall they are both selling programme and sometimes merchandise but also the play script which I think is really lovely. One, because then I don't have to think about trying to find a copy of it elsewhere but two, because if I'm watching something for the first time, I often miss things, I often mishear a joke or something or other, maybe two people are talking at the same time and I want to look more into what they're saying. And being able to look back is a really lovely thing. So we have The Effect by Lucy Preble. And this is a play about depression and antidepressants that me and my sister went to see. It um, was for my birthday and it was a highly um, depressing time but it was a very very well done play and I've also read it since so really stand up. Next we have The Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. This was a really fantastic watch. I am really interested to see in here the way that they went with the story in terms of how real the events are to the characters because I think that I definitely left the theatre with some theories about how they went with that. I'm really trying not to spoil anything about this. This is about a man returning to a place that he knew from his childhood and coming into contact with someone who he, he knew then and remembering a really important time in his life where he met this young girl and they went through an adventure together. So really, really cool. Just realised that I missed out two plays that were also given to me that I know nothing about. Uh, so we have Kiss Me, Kiss Me Like You Mean It by Chris Chibnall and My City by Stephen po Poldiakoff. And so I'll be able to tell you more after I read them. 
Next we have another play that I went to see and that is Brokeback Mountain. This was such a fantastic play and I'm really excited to own this and, and be able to read it because it took me so long to understand what the characters were saying because their accents were so thick and I I really do think I missed about the first 10 to 20 minutes of it and I I know this is a classic queer story about these two cowboys that volunteer together to work on this mountain for a summer and Brokeback Mountain became a really important part of their lives and I knew that it had a tragic ending but other than that I really had no idea what the story would actually entail so I found the play really really heartbreaking it really made me cry the ending and I am really excited to own it and be able to reread it or read it for the first time Next, we have Bleak Expectations by Mark Evans. So this is a comedy retelling of Great Expectations. And something I'm really glad about before going to see this is having watched a production of Great Expectations. I think that it would have been still enjoyable had I not, but I think that there were so many sort of like in jokes that probably would have gone over my head had I gone into it not knowing that so it's a parody of Great Expectations and it was just such a fun evening they changed out the narrator character every couple of weeks so I managed to see this with Stephen Fry as the narrator and he was fantastic and so highly recommend if this ever goes back on tour and I really can't wait to see how they've written it out in a play script given the fact that I think the narrator's character especially or the narrator's parts especially were incredibly tailored depending on who was playing that part so very excited to see how they did that. Next we have Le Cage au Fond by Samuel, no not by Samuel French, that's the um, group that publish them by Jerry Herman and Harvey Firestein. So I have been to see Le Cache aux Folles. It is a musical set in France. It is about a drag club owner and the star of that drag club who are in a relationship and they are raising a son from one of the guy's previous marriages or previous relationships. And that son tries to make them pretend that they're all straight in order to live up to or be accepted by his girlfriend and his girlfriend's family and it's such an amazing story especially with the time that it came out the original French film Le Cage Fort is quite old but I know that they re-released it as the birdcage in England with Robin Williams as one of the roles but when did this come out? Music and lyrics copyright 1983 so it's quite old and I think that what was really really lovely about this show was the fact that the gay characters are not the villains in this story and I think that was quite rare for the time that it came out so I haven't read it since I've listened to the soundtrack a lot but I am very excited to own this and read it. And finally, for plays, we have Monologues for Others by Charlie Josephine. So something quite common, if if you're not very in the theatre world, something quite common is to have collections of monologues. If you can hear my dog bark barking, I do apologise. Is to have collections of monologues that people can use for... For goodness sake for audition pieces or for um, cabaret nights, for improv games and often it's split by gender and by age range and sometimes both so you might have monologues for young women, yeah, monologues for the older woman, monologues for children, monologues for young boys etc and this is the first time that I'd ever seen something equivalent but for 
an audience that doesn't fit into that. I really do struggle to find audition pieces that I can really utilise, given the fact that I often ha end up having to adapt a lot of them to fit me and my style. And so I picked this up and this is a collection of monologues from this author's previous work. Some of them were written specifically for this collection and most of them were monologues taken from other plays of theirs. And I really, really loved them. I loved the fact that so many of them were adaptable for someone of any gender or someone who maybe is gender non-conforming. I just think that it was a real diversity of play monologues and there were some in here that I think would really fit me and I intend to use them, some of them moving forward in terms of audition pieces. And I just realised that if I'm going to be going into that much detail with everything, I'm never going to get through this. Right, so if we're going through the theme of trying to categorise this a little bit, these two books are books that I, books that I was given and I will be getting to, but aren't immediately like at the top of my to be read list. The first of those is Hamnet, which the only thing I've really heard about it, apart from my dad really enjoying it, and why he gave it to me, is that it follows Shakespeare's son, or it is implied to follow Shakespeare's son. I don't really want to look that much more into it. I want to go into it kind of fresh, not knowing anything. So excited to read this. And the second one is The Prophet and the Idiot by Jonas Jonasson. I have read a number of his books. I wonder if they're easy enough to grab. So these are the two I have read by this author. We have The Girl Who Saved the King of Sweden and The Accidental... The Hundred Year Old... No. The hundred year old man who climbed out the window and disappeared. So I really enjoyed this, although something I'm really not quite happy about is the fact that they all were kind of matching in a way that each book had one singular colour and had a very distinctive style. They've moved slightly away from that in this one um, because yeah all the other ones are one singular colour. Hitman Anders was red, Sweet Sweet Revenge Limited was orange, The Accidental the accidental further adventures of the hundred year old man was teal so i thought they were going to make a rainbow make this like purple or something but uh oh well but i am excited to get around to this eventually but don't know when next we have some graphic novels the first two are part of the same series and that is my solo my solo exchange diaries volume one and volume two so this author released a comic called something along the lines of my lesbian story or my lesbian experience and it ended up going a lot bigger than their previous work and so off the back of that they got to release some other things these are kind of set up as a like a challenge of chronicling something every day or something every week and then being able to look back on your experiences of a year and I think that the author did a lot of introspection over that time they are also queer so that was a big part of the story in here and I think that for how cutesy the art style is it's very simplistic it's sort of monotone um with a little bit of pink. For how cutesy the art style is, I think that the author really goes into a lot of very difficult experiences. Other books that they've written go into their addiction to alcohol, etc. So I wanted to own a copy of these because I've already read them and really enjoyed them. And finally, I think for the comics, we have Triple X Holic or XXX Holic. And that is by Clamp, who are a collection of four Japanese manga authors who draw and write collaboratively. And this is volume five. So this is a series that I'm already collecting. I've already read the first four and I didn't own this volume. So when I saw it in a charity shop, I decided to pick it up. It is probably going to be one of those stickers that's going to be a pain to remove, is it? Yes, it is. Great. Why do they put stickers like this on books? It's so annoying. Anyway, moving on. The next stack of books will be things that I had already read 
prior to buying them and I just wanted my own copy because they're books I really enjoyed. First of all being this really cute wrapped one, you probably see the cover from there, but when I went to Manchester Pride they have a LGBT bookshop that is LGBT run, they stock LGBT books and every time I've been there for Pride I try and support them by buying a book and so that my I'm going to stop making noise and so that my TBR just doesn't grow exponentially I decided to try and find a book that I had already read and really wanted a copy of. I decided on They, a book of short stories by Kay Dick. This is a really interesting, very very short short story collection about a dystopian future where things that make people unique are being removed and it did a really really good job of building that really tense suspenseful uh, feel and it's also described as being quite a seminal queer text that um, didn't get a lot of acclaim when it first got published but when it got rediscovered and then republished got a lot more acclaim and is thought of very highly but this was a really enjoyable read next couple are all sort of very short often queer novellas that i really enjoyed so next we have yellow jessamine by caitlin starling this was a really interesting horror book about a woman who has risen to the rank of um I can't remember her official title but has become a very important figure in the shipping world when that is something that's a very male dominated field and her hometown starts to be uh, troubled by a severe plague and the plague is doing really weird things to people's bodies and for some reason it seems to be linking back to her so um it was really really odd really bizarre but i just loved the concept in here i loved the feeling it gave me so i wanted my own copy next we have women by chloe caldwell so this one was a book that i picked up from a whim on, on a whim uh just on scribd because it was labeled as queer and i thought it was such an interesting delve into a toxic relationship and a relationship involving cheating. I think it must have been a very cathartic experience for this author. I also think that she acknowledges that she wasn't perfect in this situation either and I I wouldn't have wanted to read a full length book with this sort of premise but I think that a novella was a perfect length for this. Next one I might have to uh, bleep out the name but that is the M mm, and their friends between revolutions. So this is a another sort of seminal queer text. It was a really interesting look at the gay experience, the LGBT experience from, an exp from a perspective of playing with stereotypes. I think that the seminal friend group in here um, relies very heavily on stereotypes of gay people however they all those stereotypes I think come from a very lived experience of the author I certainly identified with a lot of the characters and I think that all of the characters are supposed to be interchangeable in a way that you or one can play the role of each of these characters in that friend group over a different period of time or depending on who's there who needs support and help and it had such interesting commentary about oppression and revolution and sort of being allowed rights um, in certain times in history and it was really really interesting there are some lovely artworks throughout kind of pepper throughout the pages which I think just gave it a really interesting feel and I am so annoyed that I missed the theatre screening of this I really would have loved to see that it was only on for a very short amount of time but I'd love to see this get more hype 
Finally, for novellas, we have Lost in the Moment and Found by Shauna Maguire. This is the last book in the Wayward Children series that I have read and didn't own yet. This series is just remarkable. It follows children who have fallen into magical worlds, a la Narnia, Alice in Wonderland, and found somewhere that they truly feel they belong, and then for whatever reason end up back in the real world and now can't cope and so go to this home to recover um, in the eyes of their parents but to essentially wait for their door try and find their door every other book in the series follows the children in this home every other book in other other book in the series follows either the backstory of one of the children when they were in their magical world or a sequel so most of these books stand alone some of them are direct sequels from previous books in the series I know that people have been quite apprehensive of starting the series because there is so many books in it now. I believe this is book number seven. So I know that Across the Green Grass Fields was written as a sort of entry book midway into the series for people who didn't want to read the back catalogue. But I personally think the best reading experience you'll have is reading them from the beginning onwards. And I just hope that this series never ends. OK, that book was number eight. A book that I have read quite a number of times this year and that is Kill the Farm Boy by Delilah S. Dawson and Kevin Hearn and this is a fantasy book that, fa pe that pokes fun at fantasy tropes. We're following quite the traditional setup where we have a teenage boy, he's designated the chosen one by a mag magical creature and has to go on an adventure to complete his destiny. An accident happens quite early on in the book and the whole cast of characters have to go on a journey to try and fix what happened. And I just really, really loved this book. I specifically wanted to get the, I believe this is the American cover. The British cover is awful. So I really wanted to get this one and I just love it so much. I'll put the British cover here or the alternative cover. I don't know if it's British, but... This has become a real comfort read for me. I really enjoy rereading it when I need something that's just going to like be a little pick me up. So I definitely recommend this if that's the style of humour that you feel that you could get into. I'm starting to run out of ways to um, link all the last books together. So I might have to just do the next stack um, as it is. But for now, poetry collections. So this is one that I had already read, but I wanted a copy of, copy of, and that is Flower Crowns and Fearsome Things by Amanda Lovelace. I really love Amanda's poetry. I think that it's very easily digestible and easily understandable. So if you want qu quite highbrow poetry, I wouldn't recommend this, but uh, their work really works for me and I've been meaning to collect the rest of the series but mainly I got this one because I recommended their work to my sister and so I bought her this copy but she decided to give it back to me after I had read it. This collection is sort of themed around Hades and Persephone, Persephone uh, mainly and I just really, really love the messages in their poems and how readable they are. So highly recommend this author's work if you're wanting to get into poetry. Another poetry collection that I hadn't read uh, prior to buying it, but I have read since, is The Cat Prince and Other Poems by Michael Pedersen. And this one I got mainly because of the cover. It just caught my eye and I decided to just give it a try. I hadn't heard of it before and I looked it up in the store and found that either the author is gay or this collection was had some LGBT themes in it. Having read it I don't think it was that obvious and I must say I really really struggled with this one. I think that this poetry is a lot higher brow and something that I heard a phrase that I heard used to describe poetry that someone couldn't understand was, um, what did she say? Uh, beautiful gibberish. And this is really how I feel about this. I think that it was really gorgeously written, but I didn't understand most of it. The parts of the 
poems that I did understand what was going on I thought were really really gorgeous really really lyrical but because most of it didn't work for me it didn't get a super high rating despite the fact that I think this is a really good poetry collection. I'm just going to go through the rest of them without a theme because I don't think there is one. So first of all we have The Lies of Locke Lamora by Scott Lynch. This is a, it's lost its dust jacket, um, this is a fantasy novel that I've heard is very good. I don't know anything else about it but I'm excited to read it. Next we have The Immortalists by Chloe Benjamin. Something I've seen that's very common in publishing nowadays is to have the name and then a novel underneath it somewhere. That's something that I've just seen as a really big, can you call it a cover trend or a publishing trend maybe? I don't know. Um, I heard this was gay so I picked it up. That is pretty much the bar about me picking up anything. Doesn't quite fit that but I got uh, The Twat Files by Dawn French. I love Dawn French, I love her work, I grew up with The Vicar of Dibley. She is one actress who like, I don't normally get into celebrity culture, but I just really, really enjoy her work. I think she's a wonderful person. So she wrote this book basically telling about all the times where she was a massive twat. But she basically did a tour, which was a smaller version of this book. And with this tour, she released the book. So I got one with a signed book plate. So... Yes, I'm very excited to own this. I, I just think she's great. Another one that I know nothing about but I bought because was gay was Exit West by Mohsen Hamed. Yeah, I believe this one's Portal Fantasy and I think was recommended based on if people liked the Every Heart of Doorway series. So I shall see how this one goes. Next we have a book that I mainly bought because it was a pound and also it looked gay and that is Follow Me by Ricky Dillon. I don't know when I'm going to get around to this. But I also picked up Binge by Tyler Oakley, that I thought was really, really good, actually, uh, once I gave it a try. So, again, I'm willing to try. Next, we have the short story collection that's attached to the Inheritance Cycle, and that is The Fork, The Witch and The Worm by Christopher Paolini. I am still in the middle of my reread of The Inheritance Cycle. I know that I got halfway through the last book in my first read when I was a kid and because my library hold came in I never finished it and so I want to know how that story concluded and I also want to be able to continue because I know that after this Christopher Paolini won they are re-releasing the series as a new mini-series. Fingers crossed it goes better than the movie because the movie was god-awful but um, I know that he's also thinking of releasing more books in this universe that are more new books. So I'd want to be able to go into that with the full backstory. So I'm excited to read this. The next one was a cover by and gay. And that is A Bored Gay Werewolf. I really, really find it fascinating, this sort of new trend in covers. I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of new covers, especially for weirder titles, have a really clashing neon colour scheme at the moment. So this green is really popular, the green and the neon pink, the uh, bright orange, and this just, again, it caught my eye. It had gay in the title, and I... Where was the tagline that I just... It, really sold me. Okay, I don't know where I read this type of tagline. Oh, there we go. There really aren't enough novels about aimless gay werewolves called Brian. And it just sold me and I'm really excited to read this. And actually talking about gay werewolves, there seems to be a theme. <laughs> um, I also picked this one up, Queer Werewolves Destroy Capitalism um, by MJ Leons or Lyons. And this book I was at Gaze the Word, which is London's LGBT bookstore. It's my favourite place in, in the world. And I was just at the checkout and I saw this and it was a title buy mainly. I mean, the cover is also excellent, but mainly it was a title buy. And 
I need to stop doing this because of the fact that I have too many books and I know I'm going to get given books for Christmas because I mean what else are people going to buy me realistically but yeah oh dear <laughs> I need to actually get on and read all of these books so there you have it those are my books from my autumn into winter haul I will likely do one more haul at the end of the year for any books that I got for Christmas but please do tell me about a book that you bought recently and why did you buy it was it a cover buy title buy you bought it because you knew the author or you bought it because you'd heard really good things and wanted to read it because clearly I just have no control whatsoever so yeah I will see you guys in my next video bye